everyone. We just landed virtually in New York. We are on a journey of our 24 hour marathon. We started this morning very early from China. We were exploring Asia and we were hearing voices of farmers, scientists, the policymakers, entrepreneurs, incredible best practices that are actually uh, celebrating together with us this 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And today our big topic is food for Earth and how might we're gonna feed the, the planet. So we are hosting uh, all of this uh, huge journey together with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. And in this session, I'm very, very honored to be together with three women that are serving within the UN uh, world and actually are running very crucial, crucial, crucial uh, projects, uh, strictly related with what is uh, essential for us. And in these days, we have been really understanding what is essential for humanity. So together with us in uh, the next session, we are going to have Berioska Morrison, she is a minister, counselor, uh, and political coordinator of the permanent mission of the Dominican Republic uh, at the UN, that now is also one of the members of the Security Council at the UN. Then we are going to have Marcela Viralar, that is the director uh, of uh, partnership, advocacy, and capacity development at FAO. And we are very, very proud to have you, Marcela, because uh, Thanks to the work that we have been doing together, we signed a, a joint program together with FAO that is uh, pretty successful and now is uh, really creating a huge impact within the global community of young climate shapers and uh, innovators in the food system. And Patrizia Fracassi, team leader of the nutrition policy and programs at FAO. We're going to talk about uh, a very, very crucial topic and to set the stage, I would love to leave the stage to Berioska because uh, I would love to talk about the connection between food security and peace. Because if we have to feed the planet, we need also to make sure that we're going to live in a peaceful environment. And we know that food security is strictly connected also with the peace. Thank you so much, Sarah. I hope you can hear me. And, uh, and thank you so much for, for inviting me to this event. It is, uh, it is indeed so timely in this very, very special day of the Earth Day and very honored to participate alongside uh, FAO as well. Uh, so the Dominican Republic currently is a non-permanent member of the Security Council. And indeed, just yesterday, we had a very, very interesting meeting and it was dealing with the issue of conflict-induced hunger. It was organized by us uh, during our presidency this month of the Security Council. So uh, just to give you a few ideas, and I'm sure that my colleagues from FAO will mention it as well, but the director of the FAO mentioned how peace and food security go hand in hand. And for example, the WFP uh, alerted us on how we are right now on the verge of a hunger pandemic. So, now more than ever, we need to come together and to protect, you know, those vulnerable communities. So, you know, over the past few, year, few years, evidence, of course, has shown that armed conflict, violence, economic crisis, extreme weather events, you know, are definitely uh, factors behind uh, food security. So, but it's also, you know, irrefutable that food security can be the engine to generate violence and conflicts. So, you know, it goes both ways, you know, specifically in contexts where inequalities uh, and institutional fragi fragility prevail, you know, in these cases. So, of course, you know, there's need to take, of course, timely action to improve food security and nutrition, and of course, as a, of course, as a way to maintain peace. And, and there I would like to touch a little bit more on what we call early intervention, and that can certainly mitigate, you know, the effects of the conflict and the avidity of affected communities to, to protect, you know, the livelihoods and, and the access to food uh, being, being so crucial. Right now, I would like to talk a little bit more about humanitarian diplomacy and how key it is to do that. Of course, that is more the responsibility of member states of the UN. 
But you know, now more than ever, we need to put some some real effort into into dealing more with what humanitarian diplomacy is. So, on you know, in talking about root causes as well, it is inevitable that we discuss, of course, the adverse effects of climate change. So I know it's not necessarily the the topic of our meet of our of our uh, meeting today, but I think it's very important if we want to have a holistic approach of what we discuss, you know, in food security and peace. Of course, you know, examples abound. So imagine now how efforts to contain, for example, the current pandemic can become even impossible when we are faced, you know, with the climate change. Just last night, we saw a forceful storm across the Red Sea that impacted Djibouti, Yemen, and other countries. So, you know, the interaction between these factors in context already vulnerable to conflict and economic crisis, of course, you know, means that we have devastating consequences for civilian populations, and is certainly a serious threat to the scope of, you know, a sustainable uh, development, the 2030 uh, agenda. So, um, there's, I don't think there's a, there's a single recipe for dealing, of course, with this uh, multi-dimensional uh, situation. But of course, I think it's, it's more important than ever to, to join efforts. And, uh, and right now, I'm talking about the Secretary General of the UN, I'm talking about member states, specialized agencies of the system of the United Nations, and, and in humanitarian actors, development actors, and of course, you know, the affected communities themselves, you know, to have information, uh, on analysis, early warning, uh, action. So, you know, it's, it's very varied, of course. So um, in the case of the Dominican Republic, if I, can, if I can talk briefly about our national, you know, experience, we have placed great effort and great importance in food security and, and having it in a prominent place in our national development agenda, you know, with the promotion of agriculture, agricultural innovation, and more, you know, the official support towards the culture of national production that will be sufficient not only for our you know, national consumption, but as well to export to other countries. But this is in a context of peace that is happening in the Dominican Republic. The, re the same reality, of course, is not possible uh, in other places of the planet, you know, as long as armed conflicts or situations of violence prevail. And, you know, that prevent populations from accessing basic food services or maintaining, you know, agricultural production that is capable of satisfi satisfying their food and the nutrition needs. So, you know, it's, I've been very broad, but, you know, I think it's, uh, I think I've touched many issues and, and I can come back, you know, if we need to, if we want to, to be a little bit more specific, but great topic. So thank you, Sarah, for inviting me. I'm, I'm right here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And this has been uh, pretty helpful also to connect to the following uh, to the following speech. So now, uh, if Marcela, uh, you're ready, I think we can start with your presentation because um, with Marcela, really, we would love to talk about uh, food security and uh, also all, all the uh, power of uh, partnership and cooperation for really mainstreaming all the nutritional programs to support also decision maker on this process. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here with you today and uh, our really esteemed partner, the Future Food Institute. Uh, we Our partnership is uh, really one of uh, our uh, kind of excellent partnerships. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here with you today. It's a pleasure to uh, speak after Bedioska, who really uh, set the, the, the issues very, very clearly. So let me just turn uh, to, the, uh, to my screen. Um, I hope you can see it. There we go. Yeah. Yes, it's perfectly. Good. Very good. So uh, on the topic of uh, peace and food security. Now, um, the, our agenda, our development agenda, 2030 agenda, uh, we believe cannot be achieved without peace. It's very clear that within that agenda uh, is, is stated, uh, peace is both a precondition for development as well as a development outcome in its own right. And the same is for peace and food security. There cannot be any peace without food security, and there cannot be food security without peace. 
Um, and I'd like to uh, go very much into detail into, into this relationship, which uh, is complex uh, and not always easy to address. So conflict and food insecurity. We know that any conflict situation is almost sure to cause food insecurity. We'll see in a little bit uh, why. And food insecurity can also cause conflict, but does not always do that, fortunately but it can also uh, cause conflict. So um, we uh, have been seeing in the recent years that the number of food insecure in the world has been increasing after decades, decades of decrease. Now in the last few years, we're seeing an increase, unfortunately. And why is this increase? Mostly due to conflict and climate change. And Berioska's point is very uh, much to the point. Um, and also uh, economic slowdown, but very importantly, due to conflict and to climate change. Today, and here I can really say today, because actually yesterday, uh, we published our global report on food, uh, food crisis. Um, yesterday, it's really out, hot off the press. Uh, this report says that today, uh, out of those overall food insecure, chronically hunger 820 million people. There's 135 million people who are acutely, acutely food insecure. This means that if food is not taken to them, they may die. So here we're talking about really acute extreme uh, situation. And uh, that this report, and this I took off the report that uh, was uh, came out yesterday, so uh, it shows uh, very clearly that uh, conflict and food insecurity was still the main driver of food crisis in 2019. And there you see 77 million people acutely food insecure because of conflict and insecurity. And then, of course, also weather extremes 34 million people and economic shocks, 24 million people. So these are becoming increasingly significant and we can expect obviously that the economic shocks are going to increase due to the ongoing crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, which is a, starts as a health crisis but can easily become a major food security crisis worldwide. So let us go back to the first part of our relationship. So conflict causes food insecurity. We have seen an increase in conflict in the recent years throughout the world. And we know that when there is conflict, all the four dimensions of food security are affected. So according to the World Food Summit, there's four uh, dimensions of food security availability, accessibility, stability, and utilization. Basically, under conditions of conflict, clearly food cannot be produced easily. Clearly, food cannot be bought because people lose their uh, livelihoods, uh, incomes, and also stability of production and uh, the nutrition that people get from food. There's, it's all affected in conflict situations. We know uh, that uh, wherever there's a protracted crisis or a crisis that goes on throughout the years, uh, people are three times more food insecure than in situations when there's no protracted crisis. Also, conflict is very closely correlated to, of course, undernourishment, as you see in the, in the, in the, in the graph here, but also child mortality also many other aspects of human development, including maternal mortality. So the effects are throughout, across the board, and very specifically on food security, which itself has effects on other aspects of development. Now let us go, go to the other side of the relationship that I spoke about in the beginning. So food insecurity can cause conflict, not always, fortunately, because we have 820 million people under conditions of food insecurity, and not all of that, fortunately, results in conflict. But it can be, let us see. So this is not new. Throughout history, we have seen many examples whereby food insecurity has caused 
conflict. We have some evidence from uh, ancient Egypt, to my knowledge is the first, when workers went to strike because they didn't get enough food while they were building the pyramids. Uh, French Revolution, Arab Spring, we have many examples of this uh, throughout history. We also know that food has been used as a strategic, strategic war weapon, like throughout history, when cities were besieged, basically what they do is cut off food and in the end, cities surrender because they don't have enough food or they, or they die because of lack of food. So it's a strategic war weapon. Now, I'd like to look at, into one dimension, which is quite important, the dimension of natural resources. Natural resources are, of course, fundamental for food security. Obviously, without land, without water, you cannot have food security, you cannot have production of food. Uh, but on the other hand, natural resources are related, linked to certain situations of conflict. Uh, we know that uh, some conflicts are associated with natu natural resource scarcity. Like for example, uh, during the conflicts of Rwanda and Burundi, uh, we saw that the bouts of violence tended to be during times when there was not enough water. So during times of drought. Um, many times these conflicts occur in areas where people depend on land and natural resources for their livelihoods. And um, not always uh, do we have that uh, scarcities of, uh, of natural resources and in conflict. Again, uh, fortunately, because scarcity of, food, of natural resources is very widespread um, around the world. Let us uh, come for a moment to drought and water, which is one of these kind of strategic natural resources for evident um, reasons. We have evidence in many countries in the world uh, whereby uh, we have seen extreme temperature extremes, rainfall variability uh, contributing to civil unrest and to civil conflict. Um, also um, rebel and communal conflict events increase in periods of extreme rainfall and variation. We have um, uh, some evidence around that. Uh, for the case of Somalia, there, this has been very uh, clearly documented. But we know that water is uh, necessary, not only for life, obviously, uh, but also for agriculture. 70% of all fresh water used by human beings is used in agriculture. So massive uh, dependency of agriculture on water. Here you see which countries depend more on, uh, on water, uh, which um, uh, countries use more uh, water uh, for their own um, agriculture. Uh, but we see that this can also be a source of conflict and a source of international conflict too. And in this graph, we see countries that depend on other countries for their own water needs. And which of course is also, uh, can also be easily related to conflict. Now, land naturally is fundamental for food security, for people's livelihoods, uh, but it's also a very frequent source of conflict. Um, if fundamentally important, what policies are put in place, whenever we have policies that want to address uh, food security, they have to understand the role of conflict, the role of the good role of generating sustainable peace for these same programs of food uh, security. Um, we uh, need to ensure that whenever uh, we have policies interventions in the field, uh, these interventions would not be fueling conflicts uh, because they are favoring one side or one interest group, or they are sometimes inadvertently um, having land be assigned to others um, and therefore obviously source of, uh, of conflict. But very important for this is to have people's voices heard, dialogue with all stakeholders as in FAO's programs on land, which are based on voluntary uh, guidelines for the responsible governance of the tenure of land, 
uh, but basically the idea is bring all the stakeholders, listen to everybody's voices, government, civil society, private sector, everybody discussing, and therefore we can have policy that is not only more legitimate, but is also going to be more effective. Um, we have uh, from FAO launched an alliance uh, in which we bring in uh, Nobel laureates, peace Nobel laureates. Uh, here we see the founding uh, ones for uh, members. Unfortunately, one uh, member has since uh, left us. Uh, but today we have 12 different no Nobel laureates working together with FAO, creating awareness and coming to co very concrete solutions on how to incorporate peace, a peace dimension within our own food security interventions, and also whenever uh, they address peace issues and help countries address peace, they also advocate for addressing food security in the same way. To conclude, um, we can see how this relationship between peace and food security is very, very close and also very complex. There's many other, uh, there are many uh, elements there. We know once again that conflict almost always causes food insecurity. Uh, but at its time, food insecurity can trigger, fuel, or sustain conflict. Not always, but it can. So we need to have a better integration of food security variables, understand better this relationship in order to be able to have better programs. We have to have adequate policy frameworks, and we also have to have the participation of those who can bring in, shed light, generate awareness, help us understand all of us together. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Marcela. Thank you so much. Now, I think we, we had the chance really to frame uh, the size of the issue and uh, also to have a better understanding on how much uh, the food system is strictly interconnected uh, with the diplomacy and uh, in our Food for Earth uh, uh, project, actually, we have been highlighting uh, very strongly this concept, really creating an entire area of study around food diplomacy and how food is strictly connected with uh, all the essential areas of our life. So now let's jump onto, into the third uh, moment of this session together with Patrizia Fracassi. We're actually, we're gonna start to deep dive a little bit and we're gonna talk about how might we reduce the risk uh, of anger actually with uh, this uh, strong lens of uh, say, talking about malnutrition also in the evolving COVID uh, situation and how also COVID is gonna impact on that. So Patrizia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Sara. And um, thank you also to Beriosk and to Marcella. So I'm very happy to be part of this. And uh, I will uh, turn my presentation, if it is OK. Yes, yes. Yes. Oh. Share okay. it. Yes. Perfect. It's working. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you. And you can hear me well. Yes. Everything okay. is working perfectly. That's great. So my, my presentation is on uh, sustainable food systems for a healthy diet. And uh, it's really looking at the policy dialogue during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Yes. Okay, so we know that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is, uh, is affecting the uh, food system disproportionately, not only the, the health of the people, but it's really posing a great risk to the food supply chain, to the livelihood of people, and uh, eventually posing great risk to the food insecurity of the household and uh, especially uh, posing also risk to, in terms of access to healthy diets and uh, eventually uh, increasing uh, the risk of uh, malnutrition. 
And that's why it's very important to have a food system perspective to really understand how this, uh, the, the, the government response are going to affect different components of the, of the food system. And it's really important to understand the impact on the different actors, not only the farmers and not only the consumers, but also all the different people that are en engaged in the different aspects of the delivery of food and the processing, uh, making it available, transport, uh, food and beverage companies, each of these different uh, food system actors is going to be uh, again affected by the response measures that are going to be put in place. And it's really important to understand how the most vulnerable uh, are going to be uh, affected to ensure that they are not going to be uh, the worst affected. So the first message is that uh, food and agriculture services are essential. And it's really an important message for the policy dialogue. Uh, because uh, as uh, pointed out by our chief economist, uh, uh, Maximum Torero, there is no need for a food crisis. At the moment, there is uh, enough availability of staples. And that's why it's very important to uh, not uh, create trade restrictions, especially on staples and other food commodities that would uh, affect uh, disproportionately uh, countries in Africa that are dependent on, uh, on import. And also no labor movement restrictions, because this may affect harvest, storage and distribution of food. And we are seeing that especially for um, perishable um, food like fruits and vegetables. But it's also important to ensure that uh, all the frontline workers have access to personal protective equipment, but also have timely access to uh, equipment, seasonal crop inputs and feeds. These are all uh, um, essential measures when it comes to keep the food supply chain alive. And when it comes to the food uh, environment, uh, there have been uh, different uh, responses put in place by countries, but it's really uh, crucial to understand that different types of markets are serving a uh, different uh, segment of the population. So uh, traditional and informal markets are as important to stay open while compiling with health and safety regulation. And it's very important because in many countries, it is the traditional and informal market that are serving the poorest segment of the population. Food catering services are being closed uh, in all countries that uh, are uh, affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. But in many cases, uh, they have shown an incredible resilience and have switched to take out orders. And this is being noted in, uh, in many places. And again, it's, it's again important to ensure that uh, all workers have access to personal protective equipment. And we have seen that in terms of consumer behavior, there are uh, key messages that needs to be um, sent by the, the policy, by the government. So one is to resist the urge to stockpile, to not panic, and then also a number of um, practices that ensure the safety of, of the people. And the, the theme of limiting food waste is really a very important responsibility of the, the consumer. Um, and it's, it's really linked uh, again with uh, to resist uh, the urge of stockpiling. The second message is to protect the, the most vulnerable. And we have heard it uh, also from Marcella in, and, 
uh, Briosca, the, the really the importance of making sure that the, the most vulnerable are uh, protected in this uh, crisis. So when it comes to the food supply chains, important measures are to link producer with safety net scheme, ensuring that homegrown school feeding programs are maintained because uh, they are not only important for the, the food that it's given to the children, but they are also a source of local income. Protect informal agricultural workers, um, uh, migrants, it's really uh, constitute a big share in, uh, in many countries, and this is really affecting remittance. And we know how important remittance are for the economy, especially in low-income countries. And when it comes to food aid basket, from a nutritional point of view, it's important to include fortified foods so that at least the, the main staples that are accessed by the beneficiaries uh, contain um, the micronutrients that are uh, required. And in terms of food environment, we have seen that uh, the civil society and development partners have been really stepping in to ensure that uh, affordability and access to food is maintained. So we have seen that many countries have expanded and or adjusted their social protection programs. Uh, schools that are closed are still um, ensuring the distribution of the school meals. And this is done uh, um, especially in partnership with uh, the civil society. Again, it's important to protect the informal workers in the catering industry. And uh, one important uh, uh, message is to avoid generalized food subsidies because, again, uh, this is not really helping the most vulnerable and generalized food subsidies can uh, have a repercussion in terms of access to, to a healthy diet. And we have seen it with, uh, with, with the way uh, generalized food subsidies have, have for example, created uh, increase of obesity in countries like Egypt. Um, so that's, that's an example. And uh, again, in terms of consumer behavior, it's important to, to, to practice in physical distancing, hand washing, and other protective measure. The third message is really around uh, innovation. And this is probably where uh, we have seen uh, the the greatest role by, by the private sector, and uh, but also a great example of local uh, community responsiveness. So again, in terms of the food supply chain, we have seen example of linking producers with consumers, reducing post-harvest crop losses and improving food stocks along the value chain. And the reducing food loss is one of the main um, measured and it's it's not only an important measure for food security but it's also an important measure when it comes to to the link with uh, you know reducing the impact on on climate because a lot of the the production is going to is lost and, and that's really um, very acute uh, in, uh, in low income countries and we have seen that there has been example of local community responsiveness to support seasonal harvest produce and really uh, stepping in for uh, when um, labor restriction movement have limited the, the access of labor. In terms of food environments, uh, the importance of food quality and safety, packaging, and uh, we have seen that uh, in terms of packaging, there has been uh, during this time, um, increased innovation uh, on, uh, on on really how to to limit the I mean how to increase the use of um, um, more traditional way of uh, of packaging. So there are things to to learn out of this uh, this time of challenge. 
and uh, also processing and transformation to reduce food, food waste. Uh, many restaurants uh, have, have been uh, transforming uh, to avoid uh, food, uh, food waste and, and also different type of uh, arrangement in terms of service ordering and payment uh, arrangement including uh, increase on uh, takeout and delivery services. And this is obviously uh, depending, I mean, there is a relation between the, the changes also in the demand from the, from the consumer. So a, a rise in the online food orders. And um, um, at, the, at the same time, we have seen an increase in the information campaigns and uh, programs by chefs and more information on how to maintain a healthy and balanced diet. So that's a, a good uh, place to, to watch and to, to monitor closely uh, to see the, the innovation in the time of challenge. So what are the, the implications for, uh, for policy dialogue? I mean, first of all, uh, it's important that the decision making is based on data and analysis and that this data and analysis differentiate to really understand how uh, different policy measures will affect the most uh, vulnerable. And that's an important, it's, it's, it's really an important uh, point for decision making. Then aligned and coherent policies are, uh, are necessary. And, uh, and, and one example is uh, the different way on uh, how uh, measures have to be put in place to take care of child care if, uh, if you want uh, certain services to, to, to keep functioning. So it's, uh, it's really looking at the coherence of the policies. And I've made already also the example of avoiding generalized subsidies if you're trying to really uh, address the, the needs of the most vulnerable segments. And the responsible engagement of all food system actors, including consumers, and this can bring innovation and opportunity. And finally, the empowerment of people to take the right course of action. And uh, the example that I've mentioned on uh, local responsiveness uh, really speak to the importance of uh, empowering people to take the, the right decisions. And here I just wanted to uh, to point to a, a number of resources that uh, are available to better understand policy and programming within food system. These are all available in, in our site. And I also wanted to, to mention uh, that uh, FAO has been uh, very prolific in uh, developing uh, policy briefs and uh, a number of the measures that I've mentioned are uh, found in the COVID-19 pandemic uh, website, webpage in, uh, in our uh, uh, website. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Patrizia. And I think that has been an incredible session. Uh, thank you, Beri Oscar. And thank you also, Marcela, for being with us. And I think that uh, now we can really go on following this incredible flow and jumping into a new session. Before that, I would love to share with you uh, just one screen because I think it can be uh, pretty representative of uh, what we are talking about. So thank you uh, to the experience we have been starting together with FAO. Actually, last year we started developing uh, this uh, map that is the Food for Earth map. And what we are celebrating today, of course, is strictly connected with this project. And we have been starting researching and uh, developing uh, this uh, long journey, really starting to understand which is the strictly relation uh, of food, that is uh, the epicenter of all our human relationships and the entire ecosystem who's hosting us. We have been talking a lot about food diplomacy now, about choices, about the link between um, peace and nutrition, peace, peace and food security. And now more than ever, we are seeing everywhere in the world how much food security, food safety, but also food sovereignty are becoming a big topic for everyone. Everybody's understanding how crucial and important is that. 
And Patrizia has been mentioning also a lot about food waste and how we are also a little bit changing behaviors during this pandemic because through this pandemic actually as humans at home we are changing a little bit our behaviors we're starting to understand really how much we we can uh, save how much we can uh, become better humans and respect the food reconnect with food and we have been running a, a survey everywhere um, in the world in the last months and we are seeing that actually now in homes people are wasting much less than before so now i really want to uh, keep going on with uh, our journey that landed in New York and I want to stay still closer to the UN at Porter. And I want to welcome uh, the new guests and friends joining uh, the next session. And of course, if we see this map, the circular economy and food waste loss is crucial part of what we are talking about. So I stop the sharing of my screen and uh, now I really would love to jump back uh, into our conference and welcome the ambassador of San Marino, Damiano Beleffi, that has been starting with us uh, a journey uh, last summer that uh, landed into a very uh, amazing uh, opportunity to really create awareness globally at the global scales, scale about uh, the topic of reducing food waste and loss. And after that, I want to involve Stephen Finn, Professor Stephen Finn, good friend of the Future Food Institute that have been with us also this last summer at the first kickoff event uh, at the UN. And together with us uh, is really inspiring industries and students uh, to really focus on how might we redesign systems that are gonna be sustainable and tackling this crucial issue of food loss and waste. Damiano. Good afternoon, Sarah, can you hear me? Yes. It's a pleasure to see you. Hi, Steven. It's nice to see you again here in New York, you, Damiano. even in virtually mode. First of all, let me, Sara, to congratulate you for uh, organizing such an important event and also for uh, inviting me to participate on uh, this panel. I believe uh, I'm here today to say something about the initiative uh, carried out by San Marino together with Andorra which brought uh, the adoption in November 2019 uh, in the second committee of the General Assembly of the resolution titled uh, International Day of Awareness of Food Loss, Food Loss and Waste. And uh, let me start by explaining why it is still, uh, in my, my opinion, very important to speak about food loss and waste in the middle of a global health crisis. Uh, I, uh, with pleasure, uh, attended to the previous panel and uh, participants uh, gave a lot of uh, explication and reason. But, you know, there are many, many countries that have been uh, hit hard by the COVID-19 and they are really suffering, including my own country, San Marino. As you may know, we have the highest rates of infection and death in the world. And there are many countries that are now fighting against the negative consequences, both socioeconomic and humanitarian, of this pandemic. And we are all together in this difficult and challenging time. We, what we need now is a strong spirit of uh, solidarity, friendship among nations, and let me say a very strong United Nations. We need a very strong United Nations. So, Promoting the awareness of food loss and waste could help to mitigate, to reduce uh, the potential negative impact on food security and nutrition in this very complicated situation. Uh, I read two articles yesterday from newspaper, American newspaper, and we had to recognize that unfortunately, our uh, collective response to this crisis uh, such as, for example, the forced uh, closures of schools, restaurants, and other organizations that serve food is increasing the amount of food waste. And in many cases, the food being wasted could have gone 
to the most vulnerable among us through recovery and distribution programs. For example, in California and Florida, we know that farmers are facing a massive surplus of highly perishable food, which simply, simply because retailer and restaurant are not able to absorb it. So that's the reason why today is still very important to speak about food loss and waste in the middle of this crisis. So coming back to what we did before the pandemic, San Marino, and I repeat together with Andorra, led the negotiations of the UN resolution, which designated the 29th of September as the International Day of Awareness of Food Loss and Waste. And this resolution received more than 60 sponsor countries, which is a very good sign of interest on this topic. So the creation of an international day against food loss and waste could be the best occasion to uh, sensitize the public opinion to the importance of the issue and be a catalytic factor for creating synergies at all levels. Uh, if we talk about the resolutions in more in detail, we can say that the resolution identifies the FAO as the leading agency for its implementation and stresses the need that any action would have be carried out in accordance with national priorities, which is a very important point. We know that uh, uh, even by our previous speakers, 820 million, 21 million people are suffering of, from hunger and malnutrition. And about $1 trillion, $1 trillion of food is lost or wasted every year. This is a paradox which needs to be addressed. According to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, reversing this trend would preserve enough food to feed two billion people. So global hunger isn't uh, about a lack of food. The world produces enough food to nourish every man, woman, and child on the planet. But nearly one third of all food produced each year is squandered or spoiled before it can be consumed. As we know, the Sustainable Development Goal 12, among its objective includes to halve per capita global food waste at the retail and consumer level, and reduce food losses along production and supply chain by 2030, which is a very ambitious objective, but we need to to reach this objective, to achieve this objective. So last summer, San Marino, uh, together with the European Union and together with Andorra and together with Future Food Institute, which you represent here, plus many other co-sponsors, organized an event at the UN in order to promote an international response on the topic of food loss and waste, in order to, to, to see if we, we will be able to do something about it. And following the discussions of uh, this event, we felt that it was extremely important to establish an international day of awareness of food loss and waste in order to create a momentum for an international joint effort. And in this regard, it is fundamental that governments, private sector, NGOs continue to work together to raise awareness of the value of food and the serious risks of food waste and actively involve its citizen in the promotion of sustainable development models. My country, which I have the honor to represent here in New York, the Republic of San Marino takes food loss and waste very seriously. Uh, in 2016, the parliament of San Marino approved a petition submitted by a group of citizens against food waste, for example. And this initiative invited the government and all sectors to promote measures in the largest scale retail trade for the collection of unsold food or products near to their expiration. For example. Two years ago, the public and private sector organized a series of events to raise awareness on the theme of food waste, waste disposal, sustainability and sustainable tourism. Last year, also several high school classes participated 
in a project promoted by our Rotary Club, Club of San Marino on food waste and sustainability. So we believe that it's fundamental and uh, more than ever necessary today to educate the new generation on this subject and to raise awareness of the strategies that can prevent food waste and also to encourage students to find uh, other innovative solutions. Uh, if I may, I would like to conclude uh, by saying that uh, we are, of course, living a crisis, a very huge crisis, a kind of a tragedy that hits every country in one way or another way and impacts every citizen of the world. When this crisis will be over, and we hope soon, when it's over, we will probably be obliged to redefine certain perspective or trajectories of development, both economic and social. And I hope that these new lines of development will focus on the promotion of sustainable development behaviors. For example, the promotion of effective actions to prevent food loss and fight against food waste. We are working hard at the UN in order to uh, keep alive the momentum it is very important to continue to raise uh, uh, the awareness on this topic. Uh, we really love to uh, celebrate this uh, uh, International Day of Awareness uh, on the next 29th of September. We hope that the situation allow us to uh, celebrate the day in a very uh, good manner. This is our hope. I hope it's going to be possible. We will see, Sarah, if it will be possible. Anyway, thank you very much. It will be this. possible. Yes. At least there's going to be the day. Maybe we can do another marathon. Yes. This is a very yes. crucial topic. And FAO also is really getting ready to create a massive awareness plan, really to raise the bar and overall highlight this issue. So I'm sure that... Following the SDG number 17, I think we can keep going, uh, really strengthening our partnership and trying to address this uh, issue together. Thank you so much, Damiano. Thank you, Sara, for um, giving us this opportunity. Uh, Thank you very much. A gift to meet you, and we hope to keep going, uh, building a better future together. Okay. Thank you, we, Damiano. We keep in touch. We keep in touch. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. And now, Stephen, uh, Please, I would love to hear your voice and your perspective uh, because in the last days we had the chance uh, to connect in several task force really thinking how might we rebuild this food system uh, with the, the sustainable framework, the sustainable development framework with us. I have also Am I on? Reed, Am I really uh, on, Sarah? Am I on? Uh, not Stephen Reed. Stephen Fee. One second. No. <laughs> one second. <laughs> Too many, Stephen. I love you, Stephen Ritz. Let's just talk one second more about food waste and sustainability. Will Thank do. You. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks, Damiano, too. And Sarah, thanks for all your work in education and innovation and action and creating climate shapers. It's, it's just so inspirational. So we appreciate that. Um, today, I want to talk about signals for change briefly. I wanted to start by touching on the state of the times, which are really amazing and scary at the same time and how many of us thought that we would ever be in this situation today. Uh, so in this virtual world, I find that uh, I'm paying a lot of attention to words and their meaning. And we're using a lot of words to describe the COVID situation, such as disrupted and disconnected and unstable and uncertain and broken. But I think the one word that I find myself using the most is surreal, because this current situation is very strange and it seems so unreal, and yet it, it, it is very real. Uh, this virus has really shaken our world uh, our economic and social systems, and especially our food system to the core. So we're in a hard place because somewhere in the middle of this crisis, we're, where we are now, we know we have to move out of it, with, but there's a lot of uncertainty ahead. But we have to look, look ahead to a better future. That's when I start thinking about other words, and they all begin with R, words like rebuild and reset, restore, uh, redesign, rethink, and, and really key words like reimagine and re reconnect and regenerate. And likely all of those are my conversations with Sarah over the years. 
but we really do have to rebuild um, and we need to rebuild the right way with a focus on people and planet together and not um, one expense at the other. Uh, more sustainable, more circular, less linear. And to do that, I think we really need to reflect deeply on the lessons from COVID because it is a critical signal of our fragile, unsustainable food system. Uh, in my work, I often stress the power of signals and daily observations and our need to act on them as individuals. Uh, we know that the food system is one of the biggest drivers of climate change due to what we produce and especially what we waste. You know, we waste up to half the global food supply annually, despite the fact that over 800 million are hungry, as it's been said. It's really a missed opportunity to, to provide ne needed nutrition. Uh, and, and the really perverse aspect of COVID is that it is simultaneously amplifying food waste and hunger, right? We're dumping milk on farms and plowing crops under because we can't get them to market while we have an increase in the, in the number of people that are hungry. You know, the environmental impact, obviously severe, you know, in terms of 8% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions, 25% of water consumption attributed to food waste, and this pressure on scarce land, land resources, the soil depletion, depletion that it causes, wasted resource inputs along the change. Uh, and the key is that it drives deforestation and biodiversity loss, um, thereby increasing the potential for pandemics like COVID-19. And that's really a critical linkage here and a lesson. You know, food waste drives climate change and biodiversity loss, which in turn enables pandemics and threatens food security and global security. You know, a recent article in The Guardian suggested that COVID-19 was really just the tip of the iceberg. So we really need to understand and address the drivers of food loss and waste, not only from a moral standpoint, but also from a, a risk standpoint. You know, in the developing world, we know that we have a lot of food loss uh, due to inadequate transportation and storage capacity, and we can fix that with resources. In the developed world, we've created this culture of abundance based on ex expectations of large quantities and low costs and excessive variety and 24 seven availability. And we no longer value our food properly as Damiano said, we're increasingly disconnected from it. So we've created this cycle of overproduction and overconsumption uh, supported by easy disposal. And that cycle is really taking a heavy toll on the planet. And we're seeing many signals to that effect. And that's what I focus on. You know, rising global temperatures, rising sea levels, droughts, fires, plastic pollution, species decline. Uh, and we know that we're already exceeding our Earth's bio capacity, right? So what do we do when we're faced with these signals? I, I experience these continuously, right? I remember being at the World Food Summit in Copenhagen uh, to discuss food waste and climate topics last year. And on day one, we're experiencing record high temperatures, we're reading about rivers that had formed in the ice sheets and the Amazon is burning extensively at that time. So powerful signals, right? We all experience these um, signals of wasted food in our daily travels, you know, large amount of waste behind food stores, high waste at catered events, you know, high amounts of plastic um, waste attributed to food that we see. You know, and so what I focus on is, you know, we really need to harness the power uh, of these personal observations, right? It's amazing what we can see if we allow ourselves to step back and observe and think and process the implications that are involved here, rather than just moving on due to our busy lives and not engaging. Um, so we really need to experience and harness our emotions, really need to question the status quo and really what got us here in the first place. You know, why would we accept such vast levels of waste when we have so much hunger and when that waste takes such an environmental toll? So we really need to wrestle with these observations, embrace discomfort, engage in difficult conversations, follow our moral compass and really act, that's the key, right? At the same time, we really need to leverage our motivations for a better future, right? We need to build on our common desire to leave a better world for our kids uh, and environment and security are, are a part of that mix. Um, we have a frame to help us with this. The SDGs provide a compelling vision for us. Target 12.3 provides the specific guidance for food waste to cut it in half by, by 2030. But there's one key concern that I have right now as we grapple with COVID. Um, and that's, you know, over the last 10 years, we achieved some nice momentum on elevating the scope and scale of the global food waste challenge. And that, you know, the, the last decade was really one that was focused on awareness raising and education, while the next 10 years is scheduled to be about urgency and action. So we're now in that decade of action with less than 10 years before target 12.3 and the global goals come due. And now COVID has disrupted us and understandably thrown us into this period where we're thinking about basic needs like Maslow and business organizations are really necessarily retrenching to survive this sharp downturn. 
And so here's the challenge that I think about. We're not on pace to slow the global warming um, that we need to be on. We're not on pace to cut global food waste in half by 2030. We have a tremendous amount of work to do on all of the SDGs and we have to close existing measurement gaps. So we can't allow this period of retrenchment to wipe out the years of gains that we've made in advancing sustainability initiatives and in organizations, especially around food. And we can't emerge from this with a focus only on profit with a view of sustainability as a cost, right? Sustainability isn't a cost. It needs to remain a, a key part of organizational strategy going forward. So you know, now more than ever, we really need to retain our focus on creating shared societal value, elevate our focus on food waste from occurring in the first place and shifting away from overproduction to responsible production and consumption. So those of us the, who work in the food waste space refer back to the war years and the depression. And conceptually, we can always, you know, we can understand that culture of, of responsibility in food around those years, um, as opposed to our culture of abundance today where food is, is carelessly wasted. And we need to think about, you know, is this, is this our time, our period of, you know, our, our values moment? Is this the part where we can emerge with change behavior and a proper valuation of food resources? So. I think it's really time that we essentially we look at COVID as creating this colossal opportunity to create positive change in our food system. Um, you know, we know that food waste drives climate change and biodiversity loss, which in turn drives pandemics, which in turn drives food insecurity, and in turn drives global insecurity. So definitely need to address that. And and the, the important thing is, you know, we're seeing, you know, renewed connectedness as, as just brought uh, was brought up before. We're seeing wonderful cases of respect and appreciation for frontline workers in food and distribution and medical. Um, and you know, this is caring, right? This is based on respect for humanity. It's collaboration in crisis. So can we build on this moment, achieve this new level of global collaboration that's needed to, to redesign our food system and, and really advance progress against all the SDG, SDGs. So, you know, in closing here, you know, I think the beauty of food is that it's central, it's critical to all that we do and to all of the SDGs. And so when we make progress against food waste, we're going to naturally advance progress against all the SDGs. Um, and so what we need to do is we need, you know, COVID has exposed the, the fragility of this tightly wound, just in time, wasteful global food system that we have. It's a major signal to us of the need to change our food system. And so I would just ask everybody on the call to pay attention to the signals that you receive in your daily travels you know, and become a change leader, right? Become a, a climate shaper as Sarah uh, advocates, right? Helping to create a new and improved sustainable food system. You know, one that balances the need for healthy people and healthy planet. And, and as I wrap that up, you know, I return to the R words, right? Let's all reimagine, rebuild a regenerative food system for the future. Thank you so much, Stephen Fien. Thank you so much. Uh, Landing in New York, uh, of course, uh, open for us uh, uh, a different, let's say, kind of perspective. Uh, we started with the UN. We went on uh, keeping uh, our focus on policies, big impact, how might we can change at the systemic level. Now, in the next two sessions, we're going to talk with the food heroes, the one that also Stephen was mentioning, so the teachers, the gangsters, the feeders, the chefs, the doctors, the moms, the people that actually need to make the change every single day. Just to tell you a little bit, we started this morning at 4 a.m. GMT in China. So we are really on this 24 hour marathon where actually we have been touching many different countries. We also have been traveling a little bit in the Emirates uh, where we were touching uh, probably some of the kids that are working with Stephen Ritz uh, in Dubai, for example. And now you were feeling a little bit the energy of our favorite food heroes <laughs> just a few minutes ago. I really would love, Stephen, to start this conversation because when this summer we were hosting the event at the UN talking about food waste, that was part of the experience. After that, we wanted to see how food plays a crucial role within communities. And so the day after we were at your school in the Bronx, 
watching what you are doing, how much you are impacting on those people, those, this community, those families, how you are growing the new citizens. And I want to know what you're doing now in these days. I know you are superheroes. You and Lizette, you are making incredible things up in the Bronx. So it's just so wonderful to see you, Sarah. I just want to just like reach through the screen and, and hug you and kiss you. But big buongiorno to everybody. I'm sorry I got so excited. So good to see my dear friend Robert on the other end of the screen. Rob, how are you? Um, and a big shout out to you. I think the most important thing to realize in all of this, and there are so many things that I can talk about and so many ways to answer the question, is that literally our kitchen tables are becoming the new classrooms. And here we are teaching from our kitchen, my dining room table. I got my, you know, my garden behind me. I'm at my dining room table. Um, teaching, talking, communicating, and really creating what I think is not only a wave of awareness, but practical application um, for what can change and what the changes can be. Um, I think the previous speaker did a great job. You know, We've got to, listen, I'm not opposed to convenience, but I would like to see us all be a little less stupid in what we do. You know, convenience at the stake of stupidity is not convenience, it's just flat out stupidity. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that through this crisis, um, people will learn to eat a little more locally and how to produce food locally. I'm proud to be giving away over 100,000 seedlings next month. I'm planting a, a victory garden here in the Bronx and victory gardens across of the Bronx. I'm teaching parents on an um, almost bi-nightly basis how to grow food within your home. You can see I have a garden behind me here, but it's easy to do anything. I'm 12 stories up. I'm hoping people start to re-embrace seasonal cooking, organic cooking, simpler cooking, and most importantly, um, eating less animal protein overall. That, that's a huge um, issue for me. Here right now in the Bronx, literally this pen, we are at the epi, next to you, Sarah, we are probably the epicenter. And in particular in my community, which is the poorest congressional district in America, you know, feels this in ways you can't even begin to imagine. Um, whether it's families who don't have access to the internet or devices for at-home schooling, where supermarkets are closed for fear of crime and, and, and long lines. People are literally shopping in gas stations and buying a month's worth of groceries of candy bars and Pop-Tarts and packaged food. So, so the gains that we've made in terms of health, in terms of awareness is systemically being destroyed. Um, as are perhaps, you know, we continue to devalue the most important people the people who are on the front lines of this, whether they are farmers, whether they are the delivery people, whether they are the people shocking the shelves, cutting the meat, bagging the groceries, processing our vegetables, uh, caring for our seniors, um, and caring for the most critically uh, critical in need. Um, th these are tough times, but on a daily basis, and, and you said it right off, and I'm looking at one of those amazing heroes right there, my dear friend, Dr. Robert Graham, I am so inspired by the acts of empathy, compassion, resilience, and hope that I see from so many in so many places. And that, that's really driving me forward. So, so those are my big takeaways. Um, you know, for those of the United States, we are starting a sustainable gangster campaign. So grab your t-shirt from the Green Bronx Machine website and know that a senior citizen and or a vulnerable family will get a bag of groceries delivered to their door. These are some of the initiatives that we're doing. And you know, no one can do everything, but everyone can do something. And if everybody on this call commits to doing one simple kind act, the world will be a better, brighter place for this. And we will get through this together because we are stronger together. And that's what this is all about. Robert, good to see you, my dear friend. Steven Ritz. I, you are amazing, guys. <laughs> no bow tie? I'm from no, at home, baby, at home, working at home. To the best doctor. Uh. <laughs> That's amazing to have you here. And actually now, just to share that with you live, our great friend Sherry is just telling us and reminding us that today, yes, is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, but it's also the 15th anniversary of Maker Fair. Makers, 
you are a maker more than anyone else uh, and makers that are actually prototyping, reshaping food system uh, are my favorite one. So really, thank you, Sherry, for following our journey and to be with us. Uh, we, we love you. So thank you for reminding us that we are all makers. So thank you, Stephen. I, I think that now the teachers are crucial for our society. So my parents, my parents-in-law, and also my grandparents, uh, both sides are doctors. So you can imagine how much I care about doctors and how much I think that doctors has a crucial role, but also doctors, not only in the front line in the hospitals that now are supporting our communities a lot. So we have to thank them all, but also the doctors that are teaching us how to feed ourselves in the proper way because food is a medicine are crucial. So I'm super glad to have you here Dr. Robert. Sarah, thank you so much for the opportunity. Stephen, I love you, brother. And I just want to, I just want to start off by this. You know, it's funny, um, right in the midst of this epidemic, I'll, I'll introduce myself in a little bit, but I just wanted to mention this here. Right at the beginning of this epidemic here in New York City, right after we were watching the terrible things that were happening in Italy, um, and I remember saying, watch Italy, watch Italy, because it's going to happen here in New York, and boom, it hit, you know, and unfortunately, we were slow to respond, but I think we're going to get there. Um, I just want to mention this. My mom, uh, who is, like, obviously one of my teachers and one of my food heroes um, and um, is often quoted in many of my presentations, said, you know what? We're not going to wait for the government for, for masks. We're going to start doing our own masks, and she started day one making own masks, and that man right there, the sustainable gangster himself, sent my mother a t-shirt that she rocks all the time now as she makes masks. So we are connected, Steve. Although we're physically distant, we are interconnected. And um, she loves you and she loves uh, what you do. And You love her. Yeah, concert fan. So I just want to just uh, touch a little bit of things here. Um, Sarah, as you know, you know, the Latin word for doctor is teacher. Right. And ultimately, that is what we try to do every single day, you know. And so I am um, here again in the epicenter on the Upper East Side in Manhattan, the, the hospital I used to work in, where to Mr. Stephen, uh, who is no longer on, but I see his face right there. Uh, we started a victory garden, you know, victory greens on a rooftop um, in at Lenox Hill Hospital, one of the hospitals here in New York City. And I just want to just take, take a step back here because I want everyone to just think about that, you know, we're seeing the impact of climate change, public health, food, agriculture, and again, to your point, Steve, the social determinants of health, right? They're all interconnected. Um, and again, despite physical distance, we are, we can be, and I hope what will happen here is that we start valuing what is most important, uh, where I firmly believe that without health, there's no wealth. Um, and ultimately, that is my goal in life. And I think COVID-19 really kind of makes this, highlights this important factor to consider that 94, I just want to say this, 94% of people who have severe COVID illnesses have one of these four chronic diseases that are completely reversible and preventable by adopting a healthier lifestyle. And as you know, what I speak about, you know, as both a doctor and a chef, you know, food is medicine and food is, can be treated as medicine. And so I think this is important. Hopefully this is a, a challenge to all of us to, to your point, Stephen, to Sarah, you know, eat more plants, eat less meat. And if you eat meat, make sure it's good meat. That's what I, I want to really share with you. Because again, obesity we have found both in Italy and here in the US is the number one risk factor for severe COVID disease. So I think the blessing, the mess here is that we have to start taking our health into our own hands, number one. Number two, I think we have understood and started to see the benefits of how earth mother earth is resting and how now we have cleaner air cleaner waters and just because of one thing i was in italy last year um the freaking canals in venice are clearing it's unbelievable and so that tells you how the body the natural state of the body and of earth wants to go back to the beauty of the natural state as long as humans step away from it and so I think those are my two, two things that I really want to highlight. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Actually, what you are all saying, and I, I, I am bringing back also Professor Stephen Finn, actually, you are all seeing this issue from different perspective, because I think that in some ways, kids and families uh, actually needs to be supported now more than, than ever. I think that us as uh, humans, patients, uh, we need the support and uh, the guidance of thoughtful doctors, uh, but also that we need people that can really advise industries to rethink the system. Uh, because we as a consumer, we can take action, but I think that we need to do it both sides. Just us as a consumer is not enough. We need also the big thought leaders and the industry really to start to act in a different way, reshape the food chains, reshape the way they're managing food services. Food services uh, now, tomorrow, needs to be rethought from scratch because, uh, of course, uh, we, we need to preserve the value of uh, identity and culture that is strictly connected with food and food experiences. Through food, we celebrate, we give love. Through food, uh, we care. We love to talk uh, about food care, not about food services. Food is not just a commodity. Food is a way to take care of the society. And what, Stephen, you're doing since day one is that you are caring about the life of your kids and the families and the community you're living in just uh, through food. So teaching uh, people, teaching kids and growing plants, uh, what's your, your message? You always say it's growing plants. I'm uh, growing. I like to say we grow <laughs> vegetables, our vegetables grow students, our students grow schools and our schools grow communities. And that's really what this is all about. And uh, don't discount Dr. Rob's credibility there. A soft-spoken, <laughs> mannered, well-mannered guy. Um, he is infinitely more gangster than I am. And it's important to realize what his movement is all about. He was a guy who was running and probably has one of the, was at the helm of one of the most prestigious health care um, institutions in what is arguably the greatest city in the world. And he felt that the most gangster thing he could do is move from health care to self-care and really advocate for people taking care of themselves. And what this virus shows us is that there is no justice. There is just us. And this movement and the subsequent movement and fallout around that will help to redefine the way we go forward as a world because food is the language through which society reveals itself. Who gets what, how it's distributed, where it's distributed, when it's distributed, at what price, all of that really tells us about the larger structures at play within the world. But uh, when you learn to grow your own food, man, you are taking your freedom into your own hands. And when you learn to dictate that input affects output, um, that's game changing. Um, you know, because I'd like to say we could grow and eat ourselves into a whole new economy of health, wealth, and opportunity. Um, and while I know today, Every day is Earth Day. I jokingly say every day is Mother's Day, Father's Day, and Valentine's Day as well. But some days we need to scream it a little louder. So I'm just so honored and privileged to spend my Earth Day, one of 365 I will be granted this year with you guys today. Um, some of the people I love and respect so much. Absolutely. I can, I, can I say one thing about that? Yeah. Well, of course. Thank you so much, my my SG, my sustainable gangster. You know, I, I we can't wait for others to change. We have to change. We have to change yeah. the system. Number one, that, you know, because number one, you think about this. There's healthcare systems and food systems, and why do we consider them systems, right? Because ultimately, the system that we're worried about is ourselves. And my, like again, my mom always says, "Don't wait for others. You be the change," right? And I just want to focus on one part here that you mentioned, Steve, is that you know what we're currently doing in today's world and we're seeing the horror, horror, the heroism of our frontline workers in hospitals right now and that is what we call sick care right they take care of the sick and that's what we do really well but the problem we have is that our current medical system is not a healthcare system which focuses on both health and care so therefore to your point steve that healthcare starts with self care and that's why we started fresh you know our company's called this fresh and it, what we call, really why it's an acronym for what we believe are the five ingredients 
in your recipe of health because I'm also a chef. Food, relaxation, exercise, sleep, and happiness. And once you define that those five ingredients are essential to a healthy life, medicine is of less of no need. So that's how simple it is if we take ownership and responsibility. Again, to your point, Dr. Finn, right there, I see you, my good friend over there. I'll see you on Saturday. I think it's really important to really take onus on yourself because again, the mm -hmm. diseases that are killing people from COVID are the same diseases on every other day, 364 days a year are killing our societies and they are preventable and reversible. Thank you so much, guys. It has been an amazing session. And uh, you I can't really wait to see you in person. <laughs> I hope to hug you soon. I give you a virtual yes. hug like that. <laughs> For now, we do namaste. Namaste. Namaste a lot. <laughs> so, thank you so much. Keep doing uh, what you're doing within the community. We need your support, we need your energy and your guidance. And so, get your gangster on. See, si Pasamo. Yes, see, <laughs> si Pasamo. <laughs> Exactly what Steve says. Exactly. We want to all become sustainable gangster. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you all, guys. Talk to your families as well. So we landed in New York one hour and a half ago. We went at the UN. We kept going talking about uh, how might we tackle the big issue of food waste. Then uh, with Stephen, we talk about communities, teachers, what is happening in the Bronx, what they're doing now in this uh, unbelievable and unprecedented lockdown. And then with Robert, uh, we have been talking about uh, the importance of uh, thinking about food as a medicine and uh, eating well, really to feed not only the planet, but the community around us, because our eating choices can have a tremendous impact on our health, but also on the broader society. And now we're going to start to talk with uh, also chefs. Actually, Robert is uh, a chef doctor, a doctor chef, but <laughs> we are starting talking with friends, that are working with producers, that are working um, really uh, together with consumers every single day. And I'm very happy because uh, we have here uh, two Italian friends that are very connected with New York, living in New York, working in New York, New York since, since many, many years. And, uh, and then we're gonna welcome at the end also Threat, that is a chef, but also a climate shaper that was with us uh, in the journey last summer together with FAO and actually now is becoming really an activist in the kitchen. So now I want to start, first of all, with my dear friend, Michele. So Michele is really a friend since we were at school together and he comes from my region. So we have a little bit the same soul. And he moved to New York and he's becoming an amazing chef. And now in these days, of course, he's facing uh, uh, huge issues because he's trying to serve the community in as much as he can. And I want to hear from your voice, Michele, what, what you're doing, because uh, I know that you also have been uh, evolving uh, your approach uh, in the last years. Uh, last year, you were also cooking, thinking about your impact on the environment. You were involved in the most massive event that we had here in Italy together with uh, Giovanotti that was really asking to cook, thinking about what's our impact on the environment. So of course now there's a, a, a big confusion and this pandemic is highlighting all the more uh, most emerging issues uh, related to health and also sustainability. Miki. Ciao, hi everybody, thank you for let me be part of this incredible event. I cannot imagine if Kennedy, which 50 years ago decided and was part of this, would be here listening to what Sarah is saying and everybody else. Is. Same will be for Jimi Hendrix. Unfortunately, we cannot talk, but we still ask what they think about the Beatles and Rolling Stones, which are still around. So it's a, a very interesting uh, approach, and we need to smile when we have to face such a complicated time. No? So, the strongest antioxidant and health booster we have. So going back to what you said, yes, the approach and trying to help all the, the, the magic areas we have here, because everybody who's working in these days, and I'm sure you guys are aware of this, 
is taking the responsibility because it, one side is exposing yourself to the risk and the other side is also exposing other people to a risk through yourself. Because this is an invisible enemy, but it's everywhere. It's, uh, it's on the couch, it's on the back of the piano, it could be everywhere and uh, it's, it's dangerous. So what we did, and Sarah, I'm glad you noticed, was uh, the idea of putting together what we could offer to feed the workers, but also to stay Italian and being very focused on uh, what are the vitamins, what are the minerals, what are the, the principles in food that could help. So we came out with, the, with the, this idea of the, uh, what I call propedeutics meatballs, <laughs> rich in zinc and uh, lysine, which supposedly really helps to fight any RNA virus. And there's a lot of Parmigiano inside, of course, a lot of Parmigiano cheese. And the idea was also having a comfort meal. What is more comfort than a meatball? It can stay warm all day, can be part of a lot of nutrition, but it's also very popular in, in Italy, as in the United States, in New York, it's probably one of the most iconic Italian meal. So that's how we did and that's how we do it. We're almost touching 2000 meals at the moment. And today we're doing more for a very key hospital, which is the Mount Sinai. It's huge. So I, I was there with you just uh, one month ago. Well, not two yeah. months ago. So it was my last trip, actually. And so I, I remember how it was. And uh, nobody could expect that we could uh, face no. this kind of situation. So it was really unbelievable. And so now I, I want to jump a little bit into the topic of the chain and the producers. We have here with us uh, another great friend, Alessandro Schiatti, who is the CEO of I Love Italian Food. Of course, uh, today we have been running all around the world. We started this morning at 4 a.m. GMT in China, and then we flew to Japan, and then Singapore, and then uh, the Emirates, India, Morocco, Ethiopia, Russia, um, a lot, a lot of countries. And um, actually, we, of course, we stopped in Italy for a little bit, but uh, we know that Italian food is everywhere in the world. And I love Italian food is the biggest uh, community, the largest community of Italian food lovers, uh, Italian chefs and producers, uh, the one that are really guaranteeing the 100% uh, Italian products. So in these days in Italy, of course, we have been facing uh, the, the emergency that everyone now is facing. We have been in the first day attacking <laughs> the grocery stores uh, and the big retailers thinking that we could starve. Uh, and so we were procuring any kind of food. We were thinking that also in our countries we could face uh, uh, the, the issue of food security. Then people after 10 days started thinking about food safety. So where does food come from? Is it safe? Can I get uh, the, the, the virus eating this food and so on. After that, we started seeing also uh, the big issue related to the food chain and the producers, the farmers, the small producer that are preserving uh, the really iconic products uh, and uh, protecting the biodiversity of uh, our strong food identity that now are struggling reaching the market. Uh, and then also we know being involved in the food service so that the entire food service industry have been disrupted. So Alessandro, you, you work so uh, strongly with all the Italian producers and overall you are the one representing Italian products around the world. So I would love also to hear your voice because um, I think that that's going to be not only now, but also in the next months, one of the major issues that we are going to face also from that perspective. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Michele. Okay, I'm really proud of uh, being part of uh, Food for Her Day. This is, thank you so much. Uh, in this New York session, but from Reggio Emilia. Uh, even if New York, uh, even if New York is uh, the place where our community is most uh, numerous, I don't know in English numerous, I think it's correct. Anyway, uh, as, as you told, the I Love Italian Food is an international network. Uh, created to promote uh, and to protect uh, uh, the real Italian food culture abroad. We work uh, with a lot of Italian food companies. Uh, our goal is to bring the Italian food culture uh, in the world, starting, starting 
of course, from the chefs like Michele are the true ambassador of Italian cuisine. They are, uh, uh, we, we call the chef the Italian food world is because they have to fight every day for our identity. Of course, it is a, a bad period because uh, I was in New York two, two months and a half, uh, uh, two months and a half ago, uh, and um, I met uh, Michele. Okay, we we, um, we we were starting for the with, with the hundred percent Italian uh, academy, and after a few days, the, the, the virus arrived. That everything is changed. Now uh, I think that uh, uh, for the restaurateur, for for the chefs, for restaurant, for uh, for Orica. Uh, is is uh, I think the, the 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 worst period in the last uh, I don't know after after the Second World War because uh, uh, it's very difficult. Uh, but uh, I think that the the, the Italian food chain we we, had, we don't have to forget that the, the the Italian food chain never closed in this moment of emergency. Uh, all the Italian food company continue to produce food in the safety way and uh, and i want to thanks all the all the all the company all the worker all the employees that uh, works with in the, in this uh, I, I i don't I, I don't have the, the the right word but i'd like also to thank for the uh, the support that they give us in this in this uh, worst period so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Actually, uh, we as Future Food Institute in this week, uh, we have been um, working, uh, trying to really support the entire food chain. So we started an initiative that is Adopt a Farmer. And so we, we were talking with uh, Fads Up before that is uh, launching with us this campaign on change.org really talking about how might we protect the farmers how might we can connect with the farmers in these days that actually they don't have access to the market because uh, they maybe don't sell in the big retail chains and so we started talking about the farmers but also we know that uh, we we need to save our restaurants uh, we need to save uh, uh, also our experiences out of home because is a lot part of our culture also and for us of course the topic of protecting the food service industry is absolutely crucial um, now i want to invite in our conversation also uh threat threat jordan is the chef and uh, is also climate shaper is has been trained during our boot camps uh, and we met in iceland and then back again in new york of course he has a background as a chef in a very high-end cuisine, but uh, he started understanding that this relationship between uh, what we do in a kitchen uh, have a strong impact also on our broader society, on uh, our environment, the health of our consumers. So here we have you and also Michele that have been working a lot on that. Uh, uh, so I really want to open the discussion with the three of you. Okay. Hi, Chef. Hello, Sarah. <laughs> Hello, Chef. <clears throat> Happy Earth Day. Hi. Happy um, Earth Day. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it has been, yeah, unprecedented times, and it's been a challenge um, for our industry here in, uh, uh, I'm based here in Vancouver in Canada, um, and our community of chefs and restaurants and industry purveyors, fishermen, farmers, um, this is kind of new territory. This is a uh, um, it's a challenge and uh, a lot of restaurants and, and colleagues of mine are, are, you know, doing what they can to provide meals, um, our organization as well, providing meals for, uh, um, you know, the frontline workers, for the residents of the downtown east side, which is kind of uh, underserved and uh, when needing to isolate, um, still need meals, uh, nutritious meals to eat. So a lot of high-end restaurants here in Vancouver and uh, in Canada um, uh, have kind of had to change their branding, their way of doing things um, to, to have uh, food and still has been kind of coming out of uh, our community of chefs and societies of chefs that we have here locally. Um, 
uh, we started to have discussions of like, well, now that we have this time um, in this moment, how things are changing and then how the perception and the awareness of where, as you said, Sarah, where people are starting to become a bit more aware of where, questioning where are their food? We've always been saying this and preaching this, but the general public to be able to say, uh, start to question where their food does come from and how is it packaged and where is it sourced and uh, processed. And there's, I think there's going to be this hyper local um, wave after this. And, and uh, as you start to see the communities starting to dig up their front yards and grow their own food and everyone's kind of slowed down a little bit because they're not working, but with their families and there's no school, but they're starting to put their hands into the soil with their families, growing some vegetables. And so there's just starting to be an awareness. Um, you know, here in Canada, our growing season is pretty short. So, you know, the market of food does come from other markets um, overseas. So as chefs, we start to start to challenge how we've been doing things, where we've been sourcing things. Um, and that's the discussion of what's starting to happen here locally. You know, these questions are coming up. Um, and then in the next few months, we want to start to kind of come up with answers for ourselves, for our, for our guests, so that when we do open, when we do come back to how it was or how we were uh, executing our, our, our operations, that maybe we can, a positive thing, come out of this with uh, better practices and uh, a better awareness that, um, that uh, you know, like you mentioned earlier, that we haven't really, there's generations that haven't gone through this since, you know, the, uh, the war. So, you know, having something that isn't always readily of any to some of these generations. So, you know, in Canada, we, uh, you know, you can't, you can't get grapefruits and citrus fruits and uh, avocados all year round. There's certain windows of time that we can get them up from California is how it was, but now we can get them anytime. So maybe this needs to change a little bit. Maybe uh, um, how we transport these goods uh, can be thought, thought out. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of where we're at now with, uh, like I said, the community chefs. Just yesterday, we had a, a big meeting, the Chef's Table Society of British Columbia, the province that I live in. And uh, these questions are asked right away. Where, what, what can we do now um, to come away from this um, with better practices um, of how we can provide and operate our, our operations and restaurants and, and, uh, and food? Um, you know, we, we already have a great support of local growers and, and fishermen and farmers. Um, and that's going to be the next challenge of, like you said, they have, there's no market for them. We still have, you know, they're trying to do home deliveries. They're trying to do, uh, you know, very limited uh, access uh, farmers markets still happening. But, you know, this is just, this isn't going to be enough to support them. So that's another challenge too that's going to come up as we get into our growing season, uh, spring, summer, so, and the fall. So um, it's a challenge, but uh, I like to think that there's going to be uh, something coming out of this uh, for the positive, you know, for, uh, for how people, the awareness of how people uh, eat, how they grow their food. Um, so maybe, maybe that's a good thing. Yeah, I have to say that we, we just did a big survey uh, spread uh, pretty much a lot around Europe, but also in the US. And um, basically we are starting to ask the people how they're changing their behaviors during uh, this pandemic and overall also uh, how they're changing their habits while cooking at home, while buying food, uh, also how they're preserving food. It's coming up that basically they are wasting almost nothing. So it's pretty interesting because uh, the, the, the rate of the food waste level at home is decreasing so much. In Italy, the percentage is that they are wasting, the 96% is wasting almost nothing. So it's, it's an unbelievable number considering which were the numbers some months ago. And again, also that they are buying less preserved and less pro processed food. So it's pretty interesting. They are cooking so much. But also, I would love to be focused also on the cultural aspect of food, because uh, this is going to be a, a big issue, I think, when we will uh, go back. We, we won't go back uh, to the business as usual, because uh, there's going to be phase two and phase three that we don't know yet how they're going to play, but there's going to be for sure restriction. 
in Italy, how might we miss uh, hugging people, sharing meals, staying together, cheering together? This is a crucial part of our social pattern. And so I, I'm wondering, and I want to ask um, also to, to, to Michele and, and Ale, because uh, this is, uh, I think, a very important part of uh, also your roles as a chef. Uh, I think that a chef uh, can become a doctor because uh, how you are feeding us uh, is crucial. Uh, you, you can feed us <laughs> badly and we can get sick or food can become a medicine and a pleasure and feed us uh, in a positive way from the health perspective, also from the brain perspective, let's say. But food is also feeding our souls, is feeding our relationships. So this I think is gonna be a crucial issue as well. We know the business side and we know that we need to fix the food chain. But I think that uh, preserving uh, the experiential side of food is going to be as important as the first side. So are you imagining how this next future is going to look well, like? <laughs> well, this is a good question, Chef. I'm trying to jump in, but I would love you to follow me. Then. I think uh, New York is a different market, but as Sarah said, uh, it was gifted to see a lot of experience all around the world in large events, in small events, upscale events. But at the end of the story, what it makes a difference and what it gives the value is the experience. That specific moment that you are cheering something you bought or something has been donated and gifted, which is an aspect, uh, which is the reason of what we do mostly because our, our job is on the side pleasing us, but 95% I would say it's pleasing the client which return or the person we are cooking, which return with a lot of gratitude. And, but listening to what you were saying, Sarah, and what was Chef saying as well, there's a, a main aspect. Now you said 96% of the person we ask for, they are not wasting. Great news, incredible news. Probably we never had such a, a great feedback on waste. But also I think in going back to the production and feeding and everything, for example, one of the things we're gonna do in our restaurants and our catering and everything, be diminish the number of ingredients, which is something I'm a big uh, enthusiastic person of. So my menu will never be able to allow more than five ingredients. And I'm trying now to get at least 35% of the menu to go to three ingredients, not the most. Maybe chef might be surprised, but he maybe knows where I'm trying to go with this. Because in a lot of this forum and conversation we're having, everybody's so honest like, recently, you know, all the ego, all the competition between us or, or the business somehow has been, a, it's, it's finished because it's in a way that you can have five Michelin stars or 15 restaurants or one restaurant, we're all the same. We are in the same trouble, which is we don't want to lose our identity. We don't want to lose our business, but we don't want to lose in what we believe. In. So but was something I feel very interesting, I'm sure Sarah can reply back to me because you have experience on this. I would love in these forums, or when we do this meeting, having chefs from India, chefs from a country where me and, and other colleagues can plan and say, okay, from this part of the year, we have this type of ingredient. But there are some countries that have different type of ingredients or they cannot achieve a calendar of uh, supplies, but they come out with great ideas. For example, the Indian cuisine, I think it's a big point of inspiration in terms of transforming, not having waste temperature, preserving, and rationalizing also how we do the prep. Because uh, we know for sure that it's going to be either phase two, three, four, 15, it's different. But the main issue is going to be the space, something we cannot control. Because for some reason, we decide, and I want to say for some reason, the safety point in this time is the distance. Maybe it's not the only point. Maybe it's one of the points, but maybe it's an opportunity. And for sure, the way we're gonna buy, storage, cook, and involve our team in the procedure is gonna make a huge difference. And I'll do a short example, and then I don't wanna uh, steal the stage. Uh, starch is a big problem these days. I think we should avoid starch and sugar the most we can because it requires a lot of water. It requires a, a lot of volume in what we deliver, but actually it's not that nutritious, even though some starch can be high quality, but can you imagine vegetable products? And uh, not only the vegetable products, but there's so many things we can get from the production of, uh, of the cheese, of the dairy. There's so many values in uh, food and type of items that we're not eating before, that I think it's time to kick in. 
And you remember, Sarah, when years ago, you, you came to me smiling and say, try this. and say, what is it? It's an insect. I have it. It's a great source of protein. I said, okay, whatever you give me, I'll have it. I think it's time because it's efficient. It's dry. It's an experience. So we're not going to go back to what we were before, but I see also there's a great opportunity for brilliant mind to go above starch and above sugar. And these are my two cents. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, good points. Good points. You thread you have something to add on yeah. top of that. We were talking about technicalities of being a chef now. <laughs> no, this is uh, these are great points. Uh, I agree. They're, they're, this is the kind of change in the, the forward thinking that needs to happen, right? And uh, all these ideas. And, and, and you're right. I mean, it's going to apply it depends what part of the world you're from. Like it's not gonna, it can't be this broad stroke. It's gonna work for everybody, but uh, you can you can take away uh, what works in your community in your region of the world, um, because you know uh, everything grows in different <laughs> different areas. Uh, you know, but but great ideas, right? I mean things things like that, simple changes, right? And I, I think at one of the sessions they talked about. Um, you know, um, which we know food waste, but just using up the uh, the ugly fruits, right? And so we always take yeah. the, the these simple little changes that can that can happen and and design. You know, it comes when you talked about designing a menu. Um, these are the kind of things that young chefs and cooks and stuff need to learn, like how to when they do build a menu of their uh, establishments that it's uh, you need to consider other things. Um, so there's an educational piece too, moving forward for future generations exactly. of uh, how to construct the menu. It's not just about, uh, um, you know, uh, picking the, the highest ingredient of what you've seen uh, other Michelin chefs using. Yeah, it's Something true. Applied uh, through. So yes, I, I agree. <laughs> it's 100% <laughs> true. But, uh, and, uh, just be before the closing session uh, with Alessandro, we were working, you were talking a threat about uh, teaching also to people and spreading uh, those concepts around. So uh, with the Love Italia Food also, we, we are starting to think about uh, making academies and starting to teach also to people how to apply the things that Michele is saying, the things that you are saying, also to our cooking class because people now is also more than ever discovering how cool it is to cook at home but sometimes then they don't know these kind of tricks that are crucial actually to eat also in a healthy way so actually uh, with Alessandro we, we are starting thinking also how might we reimagine the food experiences from that perspective so not only in the restaurants but also when we are teaching classes, uh, where we are running academies, uh, sharing our cooking lessons, show cookings, and so on. So, Ale, there's going to be something happening in the next month because we need to rebuild the entire program of uh, events, cooking class, and engagement with the community. Yes, because uh, the world is changing. Uh, we, have, we, have to, we have to rethink everything, no? Uh, as I told you before, we were in New York uh, two months and a half ago just to to, to, to create the, the first 100% uh, Italian Food Academy in New York, but now we are rethinking about that in a digital way, uh, but trying to create a, 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 a physical experience also if we have to realize the, the, the academy uh, in a digital way, of course. Um, this situation is changing the world of restaurant and catering very quickly, so I hope with Sarah, I will be with you, Sarah, and uh, I hope that we will return to conviviality soon, okay? But uh, uh, the, the, the change is starting and is accelerating everything. So everything is changing. The, 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 the world of restaurant, the world of catering, we will, um, for restaurant, it's, it's a great challenge. It will be tough, but, uh, but uh, everything is changing. And now we are thinking about this. So, uh, we, we start with a big project and uh, to support the, okay, we start with the academy also, but we also start with a big project to support the, the restaurant because uh, in this period, uh, we must not forget that the restaurant are the getaway, uh, the door for the made in Italy uh, on the international market. So 
this lockdown period is a serious damage for, for restaurants, but also for Italian export. So we, we have to work uh, to support uh, Italian restaurants and to support Italian food, because we don't have to forget that Italian food abroad, when we talk about Italian food abroad, uh, Italian food means quality food, high quality food. It means also healthy food. And uh, it means, of course, also sexy food because Italian food is the most sexy thing that we have to, to bring uh, to the world. So uh, for this reason, we are created support Italian food warriors because as I told you before, for us, the restaurant, the chefs are, uh, the Warriors, a temporary project just uh, born uh, to, to support the, the, Italian, the Italian chef. Uh, a new way, a new way um, uh, that the restaurant will share the secret or the recipe with the customer in a new way, with, with a class, uh, but also uh, through online masterclass that will be able to raise uh, 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 money, to raise a contribution, to raise a moral contribution also uh, to the restaurant. So support Italian food warriors, uh, it started. Uh, it started also in New York and uh, we, through this platform, every restaurant could uh, support itself, but could also support uh, the, 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 the people that uh, have problems with the coronavirus in this, in this period. And uh, at the end, sorry, because my English is not perfect, uh, and in the end, uh, um, I want to thank Sara because uh, together we are starting to, maybe after five years of relationship, we are starting to do, to build the first project, the first big project together, uh, an academy to teach the real Italian culture, the authentic Italian food, the secret of our, of our product to the chef all around the world. Thank you, Alan. And thank you to the two chefs. Thank you so much because, uh, as said, today we, we have been really uh, highlighting the voices uh, of many different people involved in the food system. We started in China with uh, the highest professors and dean of the biggest uh, agricultural university over there. Then in Japan, uh, talking both with innovators, uh, chefs, uh, but also people uh, keeping the very old tradition of fermentation, uh, making sake, as well as many people that we found out during this incredible journey that now is involving more than 100 food makers, food lovers, food uh, people that actually are really caring about feeding the planet in a different way. Thank you so much uh, to you all. Now is ending the, this long, long session that we had in New York, where we were highlighting our best, let's say, really the, the UN uh, partners of the Future Food Institute uh, talking about peace and food security and those very high topic, food diplomacy, the crucial role of food. Then uh, the topic of teachers, schools, feeders, uh, urban farmers, sustainable gangster. We were talking about food waste and now chefs. Thank you so, so much for being part of this uh, journey. Happy Earth Day. And um, let's keep going working together because this is gonna be crucial. More than ever to rebuild and restart, uh, we need to break the silos uh, and uh, work uh, for the partnership to reach the goals. Thank you so much guys. It's been amazing to see right. you. I would love Thank to you. hug Thank you. you. Thank you. We ciao, are chefs. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Keep up.